the USO's very own Liz Lee, Army wife and military spouse program manager, is chatting today with author of Fighting Infertility, philanthropist, entrepreneur, mother, and wife to a NASCAR champion, Samantha Bush. Liz, I will let you take it away. Much, Danielle. Thanks for that warm welcome and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited to be talking with Samantha Bush about her upcoming book, Fighting Infertility, and so many other things that I think you all are really, really going to relate to as military spouses. Samantha, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm very excited for this chat. We're really happy to have you with us. Um, I want to invite everyone who's who's watching from home to put in the chat box where they're joining us from so we can make some connections. And if you have a LinkedIn profile that you'd like to share so we can all connect off that, uh, please put that in there as well. And we're going to jump right in, Samantha. Um, right. We, we would love for you to give us a brief bio about yourself. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and what your background is. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Samantha. I grew up in Northwest Indiana, right outside of Chicago. Um, I had I have two amazing parents. Um, I have a younger brother. And so I ended up meeting my husband, Kyle, when I was in college at Purdue University. Um, at the time, I was working multiple jobs. And at one of them, we happened to cross paths kind of hit it off and true story that I do talk about in the book. Um, once I found out who he was and what he did, I got super awkward and nervous. And so we talked on the phone for four months before we went on our first date. Um, I'm probably dating myself because this was pre, I think Facebook had just come out at the time. So uh, no social stalking there. Um, now we live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we have one son, his name is Brexton. He's five and a half years old. And um, well, I have multiple businesses. So I own an online um, clothing store. My husband and I have an energy drink. Um, and my other second baby is our Bundle of Joy Fund, which is our foundation where we provide financial grants to couples um, going through IVF. So we're super excited to say that we've donated almost a million dollars. We have 37 babies already born born um, and five more already on the way this year. So um, I could keep going on, but that's just a little, a little snapshot. That is incredible. And I would like to tap into some of your energy because I don't know how you manage all of that. <laughs> Um, I love that you're from the Midwest and I, I, I want to hear more about that. You said you were, you're close with your parents growing up and, and just so everyone at home knows, I got to read Samantha's book a little bit ahead of when it came out. So I have so many things flagged in there that I'm going to talk about, but I hope you all will get a copy of this book. Um, you said that you were really close with your family growing up. And then after college, when you met Kyle, you moved away and you addressed how difficult it was to kind of, um, make that mind shift about embarking on a different path because of love than what you had envisioned for yourself. So can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I'm very blessed that now we've lived here for, gosh, I've been here in North Carolina for over 10 years now. Um, my parents live literally 0.6 miles away. Um, <laughs> So now I now I'm more comfortable with living here. But yeah, in the book I talk about, so I was used to being at Purdue and I was in a sorority and I had all my friends, my whole entire family, because I'm I'm an Italian girl. So all my aunts and uncles, we all lived within like a few miles of each other. And um moving to North Carolina and only knowing my husband was really difficult and really scary. Um, it did take a while to, you know have the confidence to reach out to people and to find friends, you know, at the time, um, we were just dating. And so it was, it was very difficult being out here alone and, and kind of everything that I was used to from, you know, just Indiana in, its, in and of itself and all the, the places that we'd go to and always having a group of friends or family to call on. And suddenly you find yourself alone in a, in a strange city. And my husband, sometimes if I didn't go with him to the races, like I was literally alone. Or when I was traveling with him, I didn't know the other wives and girlfriends yet. So I was alone just in a different city. Um, and so, you know, it, it took a while to establish some friends. Um, the best way I found was I started joining some workout classes and just meeting girls that way um, because it was it was sad at first. It was lonely. I remember I talk about in the book, I would call my friends and their lives were still all going on and, and I just felt so left out. But, you know, you have to 
put yourself out there and, and go make friends. And, and that's what I did. And now I couldn't imagine not living here. I think that is so relatable, especially with this group that we have. And I saw that Wendy just put it in the chat box. Military spouses can relate to that so much. We often move sometimes without our spouses and we land in this new city where we don't know anyone and they deploy and we're stuck like, well, now what, what do we do? And, and you kind of want to latch onto the first person you meet. And so many of us are guilty of meeting the first person and saying, will you be my emergency contact in case something goes wrong, even if we've just met. So we can all really relate to that. So thank you for sharing that that was a little bit of a, a challenge for you at first. Um, aside from joining workout classes to meet other people, what kinds of things did you do to, to feel like you were reclaiming your identity? You know, you're in this new place and not doing what you thought you would be doing. How did you work through that? Um, so one thing that I found really important was I wanted to continue my education. So I went and got my master's online, um, you know, while moving to North Carolina so that I was able to travel with my husband to the different cities that the NASCAR races were going to. And so that helped, but I still was feeling that disconnect. And so I started a blog um, again to date myself. This was like before everybody had a blog. Um, and it was just a really nice way to be able to connect with some of the women fans in the sport and, and to keep, you know, NASCAR, it was now, you know, I feel like over the years, it's also made changes in strides, but it was very male dominated. And so coming into that world, I was like, how do I keep my identity? And I said, okay, well, maybe I'll start blogging on the different recipes that I make Kyle before a race or, you know, different makeup tricks or hair things and, and just wanted to keep some of that going. And then obviously over the years that just kept growing. And, and so it was really nice that, you know, as much as I, I love him and what he does, I still had that kind of creative outlet for myself. So important. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your love for him. I want to touch on one thing that you wrote about in the book in particular, which is watching Titanic together. Um, there's a hilarious section, and it's also a little bit heart wrenching, um, where you talk about how he was not emotionally connected to Titanic at all, and you were. And again, we can relate to that. My husband's a Green Beret. He does not show emotions. And I can't watch movies like that with him because he's like, oh, this is the dumbest thing ever. And I think lots of us can relate to that. So I'm just wondering, um, can you watch that movie with him anymore? Have you been able to go back and watch it again? <laughs> so let me start to that already. Yes, he is not an emotional person and I am highly emotional, but couple that with, I was on Clomid, which is a fertility medication that I believe on the box should have like a big red warning sign that says, will make you crazy, like certifiably crazy either you're going to like hulk rage on somebody or you're going to burst into tears at any given moment off of anything um and so yeah when i was on this fertility medication i don't know why i said oh we're gonna watch titanic that sounds like a really great thing to do right now and just that yeah that rage of being so upset that he was not you know the part where the old couple are in the bed and the water's coming in and then the mom she's tucking the kids in and i just was was like ugly crying, even though I'd watched the movie 12 times and he was just sitting there like, really, you know, the boat sinks. And I was so angry, is so angry about it. Well, I hope he understood what you were going through. <laughs> yeah, I said, you can't blame me. It's, it is a lot of the fertility meds, but also like show some compassion. Like this actually did happen. Yes. And I think it was actually true that that old couple did die together. That was the founder of Macy's. We could go on about Titanic. Please don't, that. Please don't tell me that. And the mom talking in her kids. No, that still makes me cry. I don't care how yeah. many times you watch it. <laughs> we'll get back on track though. We can't talk about Rose and Jack all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would love to hear more about actually the process of writing this book, because I would have to imagine it was a big leap of faith to actually put yourself out there and write a book about your infertility journey and the struggles and everything that you went through. So um, I would just like to know what, what does it mean to you to be able to put a face to the fertility struggle that so many suffer through in silence? Yeah, well, first of all, this book is many years in the making. So it started out that, again, um, Kyle and I, it was probably a good eight years ago now that we started trying. And so there weren't the apps and the support groups and the podcasts related to infertility. And so I felt just really ashamed and scared and alone. Um, a lot of my friends were having babies, you know, 
either in a few months or oops, we weren't even trying. And, and I just didn't understand why it wasn't happening for us. And so I started just journaling. I just needed a way to take everything that I was feeling inside of me and just dump it onto paper just for myself. Um, and so that's really how kind of the blogs on infertility and the book started. And then I thought, okay, well, after we had our son Brexton and we started the Bundle Joy Fund, I was like, well, you know, I, I have piles of things written, I should turn it into a book. And I remember taking the manuscript and going to a publisher and they're like, no, people don't really talk about this. Like, eh, it's not going to. So it never sold. And I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. It's on a blog. Um, and then after we had our son Brexton, after our first round of IVF, we went through a miscarriage and a failed cycle and a failed surrogate cycle. And so I realized that, you know, it was God's timing to be like, it's because your story is not done. And even now where the book ends is us looking for a surrogate. And within this last year and a half, I mean, I feel like we could write another book of the things that we've been through, but, um, you know, it was, it was really, um, some chapters were really hard to write and really hard to relive. And then some chapters you look back and I think that's why I wrote the word warrior on the cover, because you could look back and look at all the medications, all the shots, all the tears, everything that you endured. And it really makes you feel just like a badass. You're like, I did all of that and I, I handled it. And so, you know, I hope that when people read the book, they, they learn from what Kyle and I got wrong. And then also, you know, maybe what we did right to help make their journeys easier. I think it's incredibly brave and incredibly vulnerable to put yourself out there like that. But the way you've written it is just really, really relatable. And, I, and again, I just, I hope everyone goes out and gets it because it, it's a great, great book. Um, there are many military families who have fought or, or are currently fighting infertility. What advice do you have for those who are either at the beginning of it or, or in the thick of an infertility journey? So I do like to say for those that are starting out, um, please know the cards that you're being dealt. So we wasted over a year and a half because at the time, like I said, we didn't, we just didn't know we were young. This wasn't talked about. And so you have to be your own advocate. So I try to encourage people to, you know, ask your primary care, your OBGYN that you'd like an ultrasound and a blood test and to have your partner have a sperm sample. Um, and now there's even so many at home kits that you could at least know if there's something happening, because that was what was so disheartening. You know, everybody kept telling us, you're young, you're healthy, just, just give it time, it, it'll happen. And every month that was just another negative test was such a blow. And knowing now what we know that all of that could have been prevented. Sure, we still would have had to go through IVF, but all those months of heartache and questions and the why me could have been avoided by tests that literally, I mean, I'm in an ultrasound and blood work, you know? Um, and so that's what I, I try to tell people to be an advocate for themselves and, and to speak up and say like, no, I, I want to go into this, you know, understanding um, what might be happening with my body. The flip side of that is those of us who aren't going through it, but we are supporting those who are going through it. What advice do you have for us? What, what are some things that we should and should not say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I've actually worked with a few um, therapists and fertility coaches on this topic. And so what happens is nobody ever says anything to be negative, right? But it could still be a trigger because it kind of diminishes what the other person's going through. And so after talking to some therapists, um, we found that letting the person going through infertility set their boundaries um, really is key to helping that friendship. So for example, um, after our miscarriage, I wanted to see my friends, but them hugging me or doing the, I'm so sorry, like I couldn't, that was just too much for me. And so, you know, I, I told them in a text, like, hey, I would appreciate you coming over and like, let's go for a walk or let's watch a, a show. But I don't I don't want to talk about the miscarriage at all. Please don't hug me, please. I'm just not ready for that. And, and so I think, you know, if you are the person going through infertility, you have to have those kind of, they are a little bit awkward to tell your friend, like, hey, I've been through something, please don't touch me. Please, like I can't, but you know, when you set those boundaries for yourself and your friends and family respect them, it just makes your journey a lot easier. 
And I think, like you said, going, going back and being an advocate for yourself, right? For your own mental health and putting up those boundaries that you need to. That's really helpful. Thank you. I, yeah. I think I'm, I'm just as guilty as anyone else of saying the wrong thing and not meaning for it to come out badly. So um, but it's I really think helpful. It's, sorry, I think as women, we're so quick to put everybody else before ourselves, right? Our kids, our partners, our family, our friends. And so we're more worried about their feelings than ours, even though we're going through something really tragic and and painful. And so I think it's okay to stand up and say, no, I need to put myself first right now. And, you know, I can't come to your baby shower. I'm sorry. I love you. You are my friend, but mentally I'm not going to put myself through that right now. And, And I just want the women out there to know, like, it's okay to, like you said, be your own advocate and, and set those boundaries. That's brilliant. And I, I respect that very much. And thank you for that. I'm going to pause and check in with Danielle and see what's going on in the chat room. And is, is there anything that we need to be aware of in there? Well, I will tell you, we have some beautiful connections going on in the chat and just um, really relating to your story, uh, Samantha. So everybody's sending you a lot of gratitude for sharing and, and can certainly relate. I appreciate that. And, you know, I think um, one in eight couples will walk through this together. And so I think that it's just so important to find these connections. Um, I will be honest with you. Some of my, it's weird to call them friends because I only know them through Instagram and whatever they post, but some of my deepest connections over the past years have been with women through social media. Um, There's this girl right now, her name's Jenna. I've never talked to her once before in her life, don't know much about her. We had our transfer days the same and a, um, a podcast connected us saying, Hey, I just wanted you guys to know you transferred the same day. And now every day her and I are checking in on each other. You know, are you testing yet? How do you feel? Are you cramping? And, and that's what the power of community and support, whether it's in infertility or whatever it might be, when you can reach out. And I, I, personally enjoy reaching out more so on social media because there is that distance that allows you to be more vulnerable um and i just think there is nothing like the support of another woman who knows exactly the shoes that you're in that might be the soundbite of the year so far i think that was very (laughs) poignant and so well said i don't even like i can't even follow up with that but i think you're absolutely right finding a community and people that you can relate to 100 percent, yes um you touched on the bundle of joy fund earlier, and I'd love to hear more about that because it's, I feel like out of the struggle with infertility has come this beautiful focus on helping others who are in the same boat and might not be as fortunate. So um, tell us more about how that got started and what kinds of um, things you do throughout the years with the bundle of joy fund. Sure. So you know, just going through everything, obviously, um, we were praying a lot. And I just kept asking God, like, why us? You know, we had already had a foundation that helped in different ways. And um, I just remember going, I don't understand, like, we try to be good in our community, like, why is this so hard? And one night, you know, we were holding hands, we were praying, and I just really fell down my heart that God was like, chill out, I got this, this is for a bigger purpose, just hang on. And so I kind of clung to that. And then I remember being at reach and, you know, in the waiting room or as you're walking in and out the elevators, you, you can overhear people. Right. And I just remember hearing or seeing people understanding the cost of infertility and, and understanding that that wasn't going to be something they were going to be able to do. And so Kyle and I, we felt so fortunate that we were able to go through all this and to try. And we realized when we started doing some research, insurance, you know, doesn't pay for this. It's, it's crazy. It's the national average right now is $23,000 around. Most couples will go through two to three rounds to have success. So you're looking at 56 plus thousand dollars that there usually isn't coverage for. And we just knew that that wasn't right. And then we're like, aha, it was like that aha moment. Like, This is why God's having us go through this. We need to do what we can to help other people. And so, yeah, we started the Bundle of Joy Fund and it's right now through our clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina, but we're hoping in the next few years and and, well, hopefully soon um, to expand to more clinics across the country because um, we want to help as many people as we can. And then on, on top of that, I've started getting really outspoken on the insurance side because infertility is classified as a disease. And there's so many things that insurance companies will cover. Um, But I feel like 
you know, even though one third of the time infertility is caused by the male, it's still looked at as a, a female issue. And so I don't feel that it gets the attention yet that it deserves. And so I'm hoping with this amazing community of infertility warriors behind me and other groups who have made huge gains already, we can start to see some change in coverage. That's beautiful. Um, if people want to learn more about the Bundle of Joy Fund, where can they go? So we're very active on social, especially Instagram. Um, it's at Bundle of Joy Fund. And then if you want to check out our website, it's at bundleofjoyfund.org. And we're actually doing um, an event similar to this where people can come in and chat or come in person uh, April 19th to kick off National Infertility Awareness Week. We're hosting a summit. And what's really cool is I've gathered a team of experts from um, doctors, embryologists, IVF nurses, even financial advisors that specialize in infertility. And we're going to have an in-person slash virtual event where people can come and ask questions. I mean, because especially to an embryologist, that's typically not a person in the office that you get to talk to. Um, and then of course, patients, and then we're going to go up top and Charlotte is going to light up their buildings orange um, in honor of National Infertility Awareness Week. So that's all on um, bundlejoyfund.org in case anybody, you know, has some additional questions that they'd like to ask for doctors or those in the medical field. Very cool. I hope everyone visits that. It sounds like an awesome, awesome charity and just wonderful that you do that. Um, let's switch gears and talk about Avanti the label. Um, you have so much going on and I would love to hear more about your entrepreneurial endeavors with that. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. So um, it's called Avanti the label now, but I'll back up to four years ago. It was called Shop Murph and Murph was my grandma's nickname and I was her only granddaughter. She was super girly. I mean, I'm talking jewelry, shoes. Um, it was very sad. She ended up having dementia, but even though she, you know, wasn't aware exactly of who we are every morning, she'd put on rings on every hand and she'd have to have her blush on and her lipstick on. Cause she always said, you can't go out without your face on. Um, and so she just really inspired the girly side of me. And so it was originally named in her honor and it started as my store. Um, and then the girl, who was working for me at the time, we became such good friends and just, she has such a creative and amazing spirit that I was like, you know what, we, we should do this as partners um, instead of, you know, me having it and you working for me, like let's girl power and, and do this together. So we ended up rebranding and revamping and now her and I are friends and partners in an online store. Very cool. What kinds of things do you sell? Um, just all sorts of clothes, jewelry, accessories, shoes. I'm, I'm a shoe girl, even though I am sitting here in slippers right now, because my acupuncture said I have to keep my feet warm. I don't, I don't know why and all those things, but I'm like, I won't argue with you. I'll keep my feet warm. Um, and so it's really fun. Like we get to, well, pre COVID go and look at all the showrooms and pick out unique pieces. And it's really fun because, um, like I have a little bit more of an edgy or like a, a jeans and a you know, heels, lots of jewelry. And she has like a very feminine uh, flowy style. And so we do 80% of the picks together. And then we each get like 10% for ourselves, like what we would love the most. And, and so it's really fun and it's very enjoyable getting to work, you know, with, with a good girlfriend. And is it fully, is it hundred percent online or do you actually yeah. have a store? It's online. Yeah. What's crazy is we had found a retail space that we were in love with, um, you know, we were looking at it, talking about it, and that was January of 2020. And so thank gosh, we didn't sign a lease on anything. Oh my gosh. All the things just happened last year. Yes. Do you think that you will go to in person? And I mean, I'm not trying to get you to spill any trade secrets. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I will be honest, owning a small business is very difficult. Um, Cause who doesn't love Amazon and Target, right? And, and that's the hard part is when you buy in super small quantities because you're a small business, it's very hard to compete with, you know, the Walmarts, the Targets and the Amazon. So um, it's probably safest online for right now, if I'm being completely honest, so we don't have any overhead. That's fair. I love that. So philanthropy and fashion, uh, you also have a blog that you've kept up where you discuss fitness and beauty and all the things. So tell us about your blog a little bit. 
Yeah. Um, I just try to write. I especially love, I love working out. I was an aerobics instructor back in college and then I love recipes. So my son, Brexton, who will be six in May, we love watching Chopped and Chopped Junior together. And so we'll actually play Chopped, which is hysterical. I mean, I try to like lead him down the right path. So the one day in his basket, I gave him bread, peanut butter, a banana, lucky charms and something else. So I was like, thinking he'd go sandwich, French toast. By the end of it, we had out cucumbers, spicy mustard, uh, grape jelly. It was disastrous. But anyways, um, on the blog, we I love cooking. I think, you know, that's the Italian girl in me. Um, so I try to put a lot of recipes up there. And I will admit, I am not a great chef by any means. So my recipes are very like, not a lot of ingredients, not a lot of technique. A lot of times have an air fryer involved. Um, you know, things that like real people can do. Not like when you watch the cooking channel and they're like, Oh, you know, pipe that this on and grab this. I'm like, I don't even own a tool that looks like that. So I think it's pretty fun. I need an air fryer. I'm like, that's, that's yes. true me. I need it. It's the greatest invention ever. You can put everything in the air fryer. Yeah, that, that needs to happen. I actually just said to my husband before we started this, I said, I don't know what I'm din doing to, for dinner tonight, but it's going to come out of the Instant Pot because that's sort of like what I lean on when I haven't prepared anything. It's like frozen chicken in the Instant Pot and we'll shred it up and make it into something. Exactly. Air, fry air, air fryer is going to be next on my list. Yep. So let's talk a little bit more about parenting during the pandemic. So a year ago, everything shuts down, but the NASCAR season went on, right? And, and you didn't always have Kyle around to help, but you had Brexton at home. Like so many military spouses, we had to go through this, not always with our partner there 100% of the time. How did you cope and what was last year like for you? It was a huge adjustment, just like it was for everybody in the country. So we were very fortunate that NASCAR is a very family-centered sport. So all the families traveled with the drivers every weekend. And then all of a sudden, it went from, I have been on the road for like 13 years um, to just complete halt. And so it was, you know, it, it was very different. Um, even nowadays, a lot of times my son Brexton is racing now and Kyle's racing. And so mom has to take him to the racetrack, which he'll come off the track and be like, how is my line? Where should I run? And I'm like, that's a great question. You looked good to me. Um, let me go ask someone who knows. So it was, it was a big adjustment. Um, I am very blessed though, to have my parents right down the road. We're very close with them, but you know, um, just, I think for everybody in 2020, it was like your whole life got upended and then there were new norms. And I think though, the biggest blessing that did come from that was we are very busy and go, 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 go. And, you know, it forced you to like play family board games and do things around the house. And just even like when it would be warm enough to go outside and take the dog for a walk as a family, it was like, Whoa, we're out of the house. And, and just like, you enjoyed the little things again in life. I feel like. But did you have days when you guys were going stir crazy? And, and if you did, how did you deal with that? <laughs> so the biggest blessing was that that was when I was finishing and editing my book. And as much as I am a talker, I'm a writer. So they were like, hey, yeah, um, you're gonna have to cut out like 30 or 40,000 words. And I'm like, but I have a lot to say. They're like, well, nobody's going to read a 600 page book. So like, let's reel it back in. Um, and so what actually, you know, ended up happening a lot was that we had, and Kyle, we decided to paint the basement. So we like had tasks. So, you know, they were painting the basement. I was writing and, and yeah, because on those days that we were together, like 24 seven, it was like, wow okay, we have to go to different rooms at this point right now. Um, and, you know, like my son loves to play like Bakugans and um, Beyblades and cars. And I'm like, if I have to do this ripper thing on a Beyblade one more time. So yeah, I know all the moms out there who, who have to do all that. Yeah. Yeah. All the things being a, a boy mom. I have two girls, so I don't know what like the whole hashtag boy mom thing is, but I've heard the stories are, are real. <laughs> They're crazy. If there's something dangerous, they'll find it. Well, I see a lot of 
questions in the Q&A box, and I definitely want to make sure we have a chance to address those. So my last question for you is, do you have any goals that you want to share with us for 2021? Um, you know, I obviously hope that the book goes really well and helps a lot of people. And I would like to continue to make gains in trying to figure out how the Bundle of Joy Fund can get into other clinics. Um, I think those are, you know, two main ones. And then obviously, um, hopefully completing our family. So we just went through an embryo transfer on uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. So we're just waiting to see if it worked. Well, our hearts are with you and our thoughts are with you and we're hoping that it works. Thank you um, to see. So Danielle, let's let's go to the Q&A box. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of really good questions for Samantha. Yes, you are right, Liz. There are some great ones coming in here. I'm going to try to combine two here. They're very similar. Someone's sharing her experiences. Um, she says, we were blessed to become pregnant and successfully give birth to our daughter almost two years ago, but most of our family still doesn't know we conceived via IVF. I feel it has an unfair negative association, um, like you do it only as a last resort or something's wrong with one or both partners, and I don't want people making the assumption about me or my husband. So her question is, how have you experienced or have you experienced those feelings and how did you deal with them? And very similarly, someone else asked, how did you prepare for the intrusive questions? Yeah, those are all really great questions. And I would say eight years ago when we started this journey, um, I didn't tell anybody. And I, I was like, oh, I don't know what to say. And I don't know who to say it to. And I think what's really important is that you and your partner, you decide who you tell, when you tell, what you tell. Um, you know, there have been, so I don't know if you'd call it fourth round to my body, fifth IVF round overall, because we had a surrogate and, and it didn't work. Um, but there have been, you know, some rounds like our third one after the miscarriage where we didn't even tell my parents what was happening. Um, it was just myself and Kyle and the doctors that knew. And I think that you just have to, if, if you want to talk about it, um, people will have questions and you should be prepared about that, or you should be prepared to the level that you're wanting to let people in. So if you just want to tell people you did IVF and, and leave it there, that's fine. And then if you do want to say we did IVF because this, this, or that, I think the thing is to not let people push you too far. If you're not comfortable talking about something that has to be your own decision. And, you know, um, for me, I'm, I'm just naturally like a TMI person. Um, I'm that girl in an elevator who will like tell you my life story, even if you don't want to know it. Um, but I know a lot of women who aren't like that and that's totally fine. You know, I think it's really positive to see this movement in the infertility community of people sharing their stories, but that's not for everyone. Um, the one thing I would say though, is even if you don't want to share your story to look into some support groups or apps or fertility counselors, because mentally, this is a very difficult process to go through um, isolated. So even if it's not your friends or family that you're wanting to talk to, I think it would be a great thing to talk. You know, I talked to a fertility therapist and, and that's very helpful. I hope that answered your question. If not, please put it in the chat and I will try again. Yes, there was any follow-up thoughts you're having, um, but I think that was fantastic and related for you and your personal story. How long did you go through treatments and failed cycles before you decided to share with family and friends? So once we became, well, I had told my parents and some friends when we were going through IVF, but I kept it really at bay, just hey, we're going to go through this um, and not many people at all. And then once we became pregnant with Brexton, I think it gave me the confidence to talk about it uh, more openly. And so I started talking about it and then we started blogging about it and then the foundation started and then it just snowballed into, well, a book that tells you everything about it. Um, but again, I think you could be vocal about it or you can choose to maybe just, you know, be a part of a, a support group or something if you're looking for those connections. Thank you, Samantha. And we just have them, they keep rolling in. So I'm gonna to try to tie them together. Um, speaking of sharing with your family, um, someone would like your advice on her situation. Her mother is very religious and against IVF. So do you have any advice for her about how she can go about telling her mom that she wants to have a baby trying IVF? 
You know, that's really interesting too, because um, I experienced something similar. So I grew up in a Catholic church and um, I will never forget at my grandma's funeral, I was walking to the bathroom and there was a billboard that said, IVF babies are not God's children. And it just hurt me to my core. And I never went back. Um, we are Christian. We found Elevation Church that I love very much. Um, and it was, it was devastating. And actually a little time after, um, one of my cousins who was still part of the church also had to go through IVF and they were like in refusal to baptize her baby. And it was, it was sad and it's hard. And so I did actually speak with the clinic and, and we were talking about these things and what we can do to help educate um, other people that look, this is a disease. There are certain body parts and just because they're ovaries or they're things that are tied in with sex and people don't want to talk about it, it is still a body part that is not functioning correctly and it deserves medical care and treatment. And so that would be the first thing um, that I would definitely bring up is that, you know, one in eight couples face this. And it's nothing that you did wrong. Um, there's nothing that caused this to happen for you or your partner, but you should be able to get that medical care. And then um, one thing that the fertility clinic did tell me is that there is actually something, and, and she said, you know, for a lot of their very religious patients that aren't comfortable with, you know, having an embryologist go in there and, and be such a, a part of it. So they can actually um, take the egg and the sperm and put it in essentially like a, I forget, I'm sorry, the word she used, but like a little a shell container and it goes into the woman, they'll insert it into the woman. And then you naturally see what will happen if the egg and the sperm will connect there. And, and then it takes away a little bit of like the lab and, and the science and, and the embryologist. And so that has been one thing that they've been telling some of their patients and literally something I, I just learned about two weeks ago. I love that you shared um, some of the statistics there. I think that's actually related to another question is maybe some of your personal advice and in your story, when, when for you, did you know it was the right time to stop trying and maybe seek some of that professional um, guidance and help? So for us, um, you know, when we decided to start trying, I remember I had told my OBGYN and, and she was like, all right, well, you've been on birth control for a little bit. Like, give your body time in a few months, yada, yada. And this was when they said it, give yourself a year. Well, now data shows that if you don't have any underlying conditions, that if after six months of trying, if you have not become pregnant, it's time to go to a fertility clinic, you know? And another thing that I didn't know at that time, I thought you had to be referred to go to a fertility clinic, but you don't, you know, if you decide like, Hey, it's been six, seven months, I, yeah, I think there might be an issue. And if maybe you don't have an OBGYN that's willing to run some more ultrasounds and blood tests, then, then it is time to go seek out a fertility clinic. And um, there's a number of websites available. One I believe is like SART, S-A-R-T.com. And it's kind of the national database of clinics. And what's really helpful for that is you can see their rankings and their success rates. And that really helps you know if you're going to a great accredited uh, clinic. So much good advice, Samantha. Liz, I don't want to take over, but we do still have three or four. Do you want me to keep sharing? Keep going. These are fantastic. And I know this is what people came for. Awesome. Okay. Um, a little bit of a broader question. Have you always known you wanted to be a mom? Yeah, I have. Um, like I said, I grew up in, in a, uh, it's only my brother and I, but my dad was one of six. Um, and so I've always just grown up with all my aunts and uncles and cousins around. I'm one of 14 cousins, um, just on my dad's side. So, you know, I just, for me, it was just something that I was like, Oh, I'll always have kids just one day. You know, I never had like an exact plan of like by this age or da, 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 da. But yeah, I had always wanted to be a mom. Thank you. And a couple more here. Let's see. Um, someone is sharing she's had multiple miscarriages and one living child. She really hates and struggles with the question, how many children do you have? And as a military spouse, just, you know, encounters this a lot every time she moves around. Um, so just wondering your thoughts on how, how she, how do you answer this? 
Um, so I like to say, you know, I have one here and then three in heaven. Um, it is hard. It's, it's so difficult, even though we went through a miscarriage in 20, uh, 2018 and my heart goes out to you because in time, the days get easier, but you never get over it. And I always feel like there's this hole in your heart. And so I do, I, I'm very honest and open with people of, you know, we've had a miscarriage and, and two failed cycles um, for our miscarriage. We actually planted a, a cherry blossom tree in our backyard. And that's essentially like our son will go out there and be like, I'm going to water my sister. Um, and it's just a way to remember those children, even though, you know, we haven't got to hold them. I think that's beautiful advice. Um, along those same lines, a couple of questions about either dealing with the anxiety after, you know, for a pregnancy after infertility, and then also dealing with what you were touching on right now, you know, um, what did you do to make it out of that, um, as she's saying, depression mode after a miscarriage when you just don't want to get out of bed? Sure. So I could, I could touch on that first. And, and it, I do talk about it in the book. Um, that had to be one of the darkest and hardest years was coping with a miscarriage. And um, as we mentioned before, I know a lot of your husbands out there are also very stoic and that created a lot of tension for us because I was grieving and hurting and I was having a really tough time getting past it and watching Kyle and, and more of his male attitude of, okay, well, this sucks, but there's nothing we can do to change it. So like move on. It caused a lot of tension. And that's where we sought out a therapist, which I think is a great idea because when that tension's in the marriage, it blows up everything from dishes in the sink to, you know, what, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and so I think it's important to have an outside party that could be like, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. Let's work through this together as individuals and as a couple so that you could get back on the same page because um, a miscarriage is, is not easy. It is, it's very difficult. Um, I will be fully honest. I could have tested this morning to find out if we were pregnant, but I'm scared too. I had went this whole week being so positive and so excited. And it was almost like this morning was Christmas morning. And I sat there and I was like, nope not doing it. Like I, I sat there this morning and I had the test and I was like, I, I can't, I can't do it yet. Um, and, and, you know, that's okay. And I think understanding that even though people around you might not understand, like people told me, you know, during the miscarriage, well, at least you weren't that far along. That's what everybody said. You weren't that far along. It doesn't matter if you were six days, six weeks, I, I, I don't care where you were. It's very painful and you have to give yourself that grace to grieve and to cope with what you've, you've went through. And I'm sorry, I rambled. I completely forgot your first question. No, you definitely answered. I think the second or the add-on question was also dealing with those anxieties and emotions that come when you do get pregnant after you've faced those battles with infertility. Um. I wish I had better advice. Um, I try to stay positive. Um, you know, I did mention a few things. I, I like to journal. I like to work out. Um, I found Elevation Church, which is like amazing. It just helps me stay more positive. Um, but, you know, with all that said too, I mean, I, I'm scared. I have so much anxiety right now. I just don't want to take a test and just keep living in this world of it worked. She's in there. Good job. We're just going to roll with that. But like, I know eventually I, I have to, you know, obviously rip the bandaid off and find out. So. Well, I know you can't see everything going on in the chat, but it's just, um, it will warm your heart to know that there are just so many amazing connections happening. And a, a lot of people are just sending you their love and their gratitude because they're having very, very similar journeys right now. And they're um, actually helping each other out. So this is this has been amazing. Um, love the parallels to you as a NASCAR wife. We do have a question about that. NASCAR racing can be a dangerous sport. Likewise, many of us military spouses are always worried for our spouse's safety on the job. Do you have any tips for alleviating that sort of stress and worry? 
Honestly, I don't. Um, we just say a prayer before every race. Um, so I talk about it in the book, but when I was 28 weeks pregnant with Brexton, my um, husband got in a horrific head-on crash with a wall that didn't have a safer barrier. So he basically hit a concrete wall at 100 miles an hour and the entire front of the car came back and smashed through his legs. Um, and he was, you know, he had a broken tib and fib and a shattered foot and all the things. And and as awful as that was, we prayed right before it and, and he, he made it through it. And so I think that's just something so important. And now, even with my son racing, just gosh, I, before he goes out, I fidget and I'm like, please God, just, just keep him safe. Like there's, it's really all, you, you know, you can do because their job and, and for me racing is, is what they love and it's their passion. And so I don't want to, you know, bring negativity to it. And so I guess, I guess that's my way of kind of coping with it is just saying a prayer. We can so relate to that. So many of us who, who faced through deployments and have had spouses leave for dangerous places and people say, well, you're crazy, but you knew what you got into, right? You knew what you were marrying into. This is their passion and we would never dream of taking it away from them. So we support yes. them and we pray like heck when we, when we can and the rest is kind of out of our hands, right? I love how you said that because people are like, oh, do you wish you didn't do it? And yeah, same thing. Like, oh, well, it is dangerous, but you knew that. And I'm like, but you don't marry their job. You marry the man you love. And this just happens to be their job. And so even if they're not scared or worried, like you can be worried for them. And, and so I love how you said that. Absolutely. They, they would never show the worry and the fear. They would never show any sort of trepidation. You know, they're going to run towards the gunfire every time, but we're off on the sidelines, like trying to hold it together during all of that. Yeah. And, <sighs> and on a lighter note, so I used to go to all the races with my husband, but now my husband and son are racing on Sundays together. So a lot of times I'm staying home at Brexton and my husband is funny. He was like, Oh, I remember like, you know, when you'd be so worried and you'd come with me and now you've just thrown me aside. I'm like, you are a grown ass man. Like I have to be there with my baby. Like he doesn't even know how to tie his shoes all the way yet. And he drive, they drive at like 40 plus miles an hour as five-year-olds. I, I don't, I don't, me I don't know how you do that as a mother. Like I couldn't watch that. <laughs> I cringe. And it's funny because my son is a mini you know, replica of my husband and he just thinks it's so fun and they love that danger factor. And that's why I'm like, dear God, if we're blessed with a little girl, please just make her want to do things like dance and cheerleading. And I don't know, golf, golf is a great safe sport. Do you know, like, please don't want her to get into these cars that, you know, they're, you should, I, I encourage you guys, you will think I'm crazy. If you look up beginner box stock kids racing, these five, six, seven year olds are flying around tracks at 40 miles an hour, like, you know, beaten and banging. Oh, I do say somebody just said cheerleading makes me, and I think it's going to say nervous. You are right. I was a cheerleader. I was a flyer. And um, yeah, so maybe not cheerleading, like anything where you're not in the air, safe to the ground, bowling, um, <laughs> was another bad mitten I feel good about, like, table tennis is a very safe one, somebody <laughs> said tennis, I actually, the only injury, knock on wood, not wood, that I've had, my freshman year of high school, I went out for gym class to go play tennis and broke my ankle, so, oh gosh, tripped over awesome. my other foot, wasn't even playing, was walking out and tripped over my other foot, so, I got hooked on the show cheer last year on Netflix and it would like make me sweat watching the flyers. So when you said you're a flyer, like I started sweating, that makes me oh, so very nervous. Middle school flyer, not an exciting flyer, like just like the easy little ones, but you know, yeah. Cheerleading is, I, yeah, I should definitely take that back because cheerleading is intense, especially the competitive ones. But yeah, I was like young, easy cheerleading. <laughs> And I think that goes back to how you say Brexton's like, this is great. I'm just going fast. Like they're young and they don't think about any sort of consequences or danger that might be lurking. So, you know, let them have Never. fun. Oh, but I bet you, mm. so actually I, I'm curious to know what, 
what is a typical day at the racetrack like for you? I mean, in your book, you talk about how you guys have this great, um, is it a trailer that you talk about where you live? Um, and then you have a special place that you watch the race, but like, are you with other spouses? Are you alone because you like to be with your thoughts? What's it, what's a day at the racetrack like? Yeah. Well, um, now it's like non-existent. So I'll tell you like pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, yeah, everybody kind of has motorhomes. We call ourselves like a traveling circus almost, right? And it's really fun because there's like, you, well, there's 42 drivers, but a lot of, you know, depending if they're if they're single or not. Anyways, there's a good, you know, 20, 30 families at the racetrack with kids. And so it's so fun. You're almost like in this little community. In the evenings, people would be grilling out. All the kids would be like riding scooters and bikes in the little lot. And then for us, we've always homeschooled Brexton because we traveled so much. So, you know, a typical day, if it wasn't race day, would we, you know, get up, do our school. And then it was amazing to get to go explore all these cities. And so now that I've been traveling for 13 years, minus 2020 in this year, um, you had like your favorites, your favorite restaurants or your favorite. Um, there's so many beautiful hikes across the country um, that we would go do that were so fun. Um, and then on race day, race day was different. You know, I would watch from the pit box and that's where the engineer and the crew chief are. And so you could see the pit stops and everything. And, and it was so great because you were so intimately involved. Like you knew exactly what was happening. Um, and it really made you feel like part of the team. So yeah, now being able just to watch it, you know, on TV and things, it's very difficult. So it's a different experience. One of my yeah. first dates with my husband, who's a NASCAR fan, I got him tickets to a race. We, we met in Japan, but we moved back to the States and I was like, oh, okay. He likes NASCAR. We're going to go see it, a race. And I could never watch it on TV, but my goodness, in person, it's actually really fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. It's really exciting. And like the, the smells and the sights and the sounds. And so, yeah, I'm just really ready for life to get back to normal because, you know, that's, it, it was so normal to us for so many years to be such a big part of it. And Brexton loved like having his little friends at the track, um, but it's fun now because most of them all race together. So it's, it's kind of cool to see the next generation coming up. That's exactly it. I hope you have all the pictures of them now at this age. Because, yes. Oh my gosh, that is awesome. Well, we are coming up at the top of the hour and we want to be sensitive to everyone's time, especially yours, Samantha. So everybody go out and get Fighting Infertility. It is a fantastic book. Um, you will not regret reading it, just like we don't regret talking with you today, Samantha. Uh, does it come out the 30th of March? Is that right? Yes, it comes out March 30th. And I, I haven't opened the chat, but just in case, you know, anybody did have some more questions or anything, um, send me a DM at, at Samantha Bush. I'll try to get through them all this weekend. I just didn't want to, you know, leave anybody hanging if they had a, a question. Thank you so much for that. And for those who want to follow along with you on social media, I know we've talked about your blog and everything else, but what is your actual social media handle? At Samantha Bush. And we are Bush, B-U-S-C-H. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, Samantha, thank you so much for being with us today and for opening your heart and your lives to all of us and sharing your story. I can just tell from what's popping up on the chat and in the questions how much this meant to everybody and how this really got people to feel heard and to feel seen. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us and, and thank you for being with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. And most importantly, we hope you have the best success um, with your transplant. We hope you find out good news very soon. Ah, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who tuned in. Um, I know that, you know, infertility is a topic that's very hard to open up about. And so I love and am so encouraged that people were connecting in the chat because that's what this is. This is a like infertility sisterhood. And when you can go through this journey with, you know, another person, it just, it makes it so much easier. I have nothing to add to that. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you everybody so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank Thanks you. For being Bye, here. everyone. Take care. Bye.